tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to Season 7, Episode 9. I'm your host, Eric Peabody, and tonight kicks off the first part of a terrifying trilogy. Pine Bend is a quiet, safe community in the foothills of North Carolina. Its humble residents enjoy hiking, hunting, and small-town life. All of that is about to be interrupted by a gruesome murder and a savage attack. The locals search for a man that is responsible, but are they looking for the right thing? The Schultz family is convinced that it's something else, something more primal, something more evil. The Schultz family is about to have their love and loyalty put to the test as they seek out this terror in the pines. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly sponsored by Mr. Ballin, an Amazon Music exclusive podcast. Are you a fan of the dark and mysterious? Do glitches in the matrix make your heart feel a flutter? Do you love challenging your mind while listening to amazing audio programs? Then do I have the podcast for you. This one is an Amazon Music exclusive called the Mr. Ballin Podcast. In each episode, Mr. Ballin shares real-life, haunting accounts. Like the case of Haley Zaga, who disappeared from a hiking trail for 51 hours. When search and rescue workers finally found her and asked how she survived, she simply said that a friend helped her. She described this friend four years old, black hair, brown eyes. This friend was initially dismissed until they realized a girl had gone missing in that exact spot 23 years earlier and was never found. She was four years old, 
had black hair and brown eyes. Fearful fiction is fun and all, but I really enjoy listening to the haunting tales of real events. That's what I love about Mr. Ballin. They have oddities and tales for all to enjoy. Hey, Amazon Prime members, listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast, Mr. Ballin Podcast, Strange, Dark, and Mysterious Stories in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. Did I mention they were ad-free? Thank you for your support. And now, from author Justin Vinbill, I give you It Came from the Pines, Part 1. Part 1. Smoke. The smell of burning wood wafted through the air on a chilly night in the small rural town of Pine Bend. Eric, a local fireman, was off duty that night and was far from disturbed by the rising smoke. It was his first fall here, and he loved the quaint town and serving its people. It was a breath of fresh air compared to back home in Jersey. Ready for your next can? Asked the man sitting in the camping chair next to him. David was a tall, muscular man with short, dark hair and a well-kept beard. He had invited Eric to this men's night, he had called it. He stoked the fire pit that the four of them sat around. He's probably not even finished with his first one yet, Dave, remarked a grizzle-faced man. Eric wasn't too fond of his southern drawl and how he abbreviated his words. You know, Jack, he probably doesn't want to become an alcoholic, like you, said Brandon. David's brother, who was clean-shaven with his shirt neatly tucked in. Jack responded in kind by flipping the bird at him. Sure, Dave, I'd love another one. Do you have any pale? What the hell kind of fireman drinks that pale shit? Jack said with a grin. Knock it off, jackass, David said with an even bigger grin and a hearty laugh. All of the men started to follow David's example and began a chorus of laughter when a howl carried through the woods near them. There it is again. This is the third or fourth time we've heard it this month, said Brandon, with his head cocked to the left. I don't know what the hell that was, but damn if it isn't eerie, Jack exclaimed. You've heard that before? asked Eric in surprise. Yeah, David and I sit out here every Friday night. We always hear noises in the woods from animals like foxes, raccoons, coyotes, and such. We've been near these woods since we were kids and used to explore them with our sister. Brandon replied to Eric's question. Jack took a long swig of his lager and crushed the can in his hand. You know, speaking of your sister, she's still trying to get me to go hiking with her around the bend. I promised her I would, as soon as I don't work a sixty-hour week, exclaimed Jack. Ah, the life of a handyman, huh? replied Brandon with his usual sarcasm. A wide smile cracked across Jack's hawkish features as if he had just thought of the best comeback in history. Beats selling cars to rich assholes, doesn't it? Brandon slumped back in his chair with a defensive grimace. It's just a joke, Brand. I don't really... Jack's sentence was interrupted by another howl. There was a visible look of unease on the quadri of men. All right, I think it's time to call it a night. The smoke keeps melting my eyes anyway, David said as he covered his face. Alex is probably expecting me soon anyway said Brandon as he rose from his chair and stretched abruptly. Well, you guys want to make this a regular thing? 
asked David. Sure, I had a good time. It was relaxing, for the most part, Eric replied with a slight nod. Jack departed with a good night, assholes, and went into the basement where he and his wife Anna stayed. David walked Brandon and Eric to the gate that led to the driveway. Drive safe, bro. Let me know if you have any trouble with that lemon, David said with what Eric's dad would have called a shit-eating grin. You'll never let me forget that one, will you? Asked Brandon, as if he already knew the answer. David just laughed and hugged his brother. After Brandon drove off, Eric asked, What's the joke about his car? Oh, that? Well, as you know, he's a car salesman, right? Eric nodded in response. My brother has always had a thing for sports cars. He always wanted a 96 Camaro, and one day our uncle offered to sell him his 96 Camaro. Old Brand jumped on it like a crack addict needing a fix. Eric let out a loud laugh. Oh, it gets better. You see, he sells luxury cars, and one day that 2018 Camaro comes to the dealership and he falls in love with it. He trades in his 96 for it and thinks he's got a great deal. After finding out that he traded it, I told him that 2018 was known to be a money pit. So, anyway, he had about three or four things break on it in the first year of having it. He hits several curbs because he can't see out of them. You get the idea that he had his rotor lock up on him. Eric nodded and waited to hear more. Last month he says to me, David, I finally got everything working right on this. David's mouth parted wide as if he was trying to contain an outburst of chuckling. The very next day, he said that the alternator gave out and left him stranded at a Walmart. He called me at, like, midnight to come jumpstart his car. I couldn't help but die laughing when I picked him up. David burst out in laughter, and Eric joined him. The two friends continued talking for another hour. Eric shared some calls he had gone on, both on the funny side and the morbid one. Man, I'm really glad we met, said David. Yeah, same. Thanks for reaching out to me after the service. I don't think I'd be as comfortable down south here without you and Brandon. Eric had just moved to Pine Bend in late June. It was October now, and even though the North Carolina weather was chilly, it was nothing compared to the frigid fall of New Jersey. Eric was glad that David approached him and shook his hand after church the previous month. Eric felt he was just reserved, introverted, as kids called it these days. He wasn't very good at making friends, and his wife, Emily, lovingly called him Lone Ranger. Well, thank you again, Dave. I'll bring the beer next time, and some cigars, too. That sounds good, man. Drive safe, responded David. Eric got into his old Ford Ranger and drove off down the long, deserted country road. David walked over to the fire pit, grabbed the poker, and jabbed at the fire to smolder it. He watched the embers glow and dim rapidly and was amused by it. His amusement was broken by the same howl that met his ear twice that night already. The howl sounded much closer this time. It sounded like it was far off and deep within the pines. Tonight, however, alone in his backyard in the pitched darkness, he felt a sense of fright. The hair on his neck stood erect, like the tall pine trees surrounding his fenced yard. David was a strong and confident man. His pre-dawn hours were usually spent at the gym. He stood well over six feet tall and was an experienced hunter. Being spooked was something he seldom felt on any occasion. How cliched, he thought to himself as he felt like eyes were upon him. He decided to let the fire burn out naturally, opened the back door, and stepped inside his warm, well-lit home. David, is that you? Rachel asked as he entered their bedroom quietly. Yeah, babe, it's me. Just coming to bed. 
You were out there for a while. Did Brandon need career advice again? No, I was talking to Eric. I like him. Good guy. Did Eric and Jack get along? Rachel asked. I don't think Eric likes Jack very much, but neither did I at first. He's an acquired taste. <laughs> like that bottle of bubbly you brought home yesterday, Rachel said with a snicker. Hey, it wasn't that bad. Besides, it was more about toasting to my success than anything. True, but you know I prefer the fruity kinds. David sat on the bed next to his wife, who had been reading a book when he entered. <sighs> November is going to be the busiest month of my life, he said with a deep sigh. David ran a successful insurance business. He was so successful that this year he had to hire half a dozen new agents to help him get everyone signed up for open enrollment. He was expecting it to be his most successful year yet. I'm proud of you. You deserve everything good. You know that. Rachel said as she held David's bearded face with one hand. Maybe, but one good thing I don't deserve is you. He held the back of her brunette head, hair tied into a messy bun, and kissed his wife. Part 2 Eyes David awoke with a strong urge to use the bathroom. Damn, why did I drink three beers? He walked into the master bathroom and relieved the pressure on his bladder. After finishing, he walked over to the sink to wash his hands and glanced out the window. He saw a glowing pair of yellow eyes. They weren't looking directly at him, but it seemed like they were trying to see into the yard through the gaps in the wooden fence. David stared at the eyes, wondering if it was a coyote or even a black bear. He hadn't seen a bear in these woods in over a decade since he had been a teenager. He thought about how strange it would be to see a bear since he and Jack had been scouting out the woods for deer season. Surely they would have seen a sign of one between the two of them if it was nearby. The eyes shifted upward, towards David. The animal's and David's eyes were locked like a chest in the sea. He felt very secure on the second story of his brick house. After ten seconds of staring, the thing turned away and ran into the woods. It was so dark that David couldn't make out any distinctive features. Uh, something to check out in the morning, David thought as he let out a yawn. He crawled back into bed and quickly fell back asleep. The morning sun greeted Jack with radiant warmth, almost as if God had told him that today would be a good day. Ring of Fire by Johnny Cash boomed through the speakers of Jack's Chevy. He was singing along with it after it got stuck in his head the night before when Eric played it. Jack thought that Eric was all right, for a Yankee. Sure, he wasn't a good old boy like Dave and Brandon, but he was all right. He had good taste in music, which Jack was certain of. He strummed on his air guitar while steering the truck with his knees. He was on his way to install several light fixtures for a customer in North Bend, an area above Pine Bend. Jack was looking forward to the job. He had installed hundreds of light fixtures and could make a good profit for just an hour of work. When Jack arrived at the house, the homeowner greeted him with a firm handshake. You must be Mr. Peterson, Jack stated as he shook the man's hand. Yep, let me show you what I need done, he replied with a broad southern accent common to lifelong residents. Jack gazed at the house, a three-story brick house with a metal roof. Mr. Peterson was a bald, clean-shaven, round man in his mid-fifties. His image contrasted with Jack's lean body with shoulder-length blonde hair and a rough beard. This guy should pay pretty well. At least he's less likely to be a cheap ass, Jack thought to himself. Mr. Peterson led Jack to the side of the house that faced the woods. 
he pointed up at a broken light fixture. We don't know what happened. Maybe some teenagers with too much free time. My wife came out and saw it this morning. She's pissed. The light fixture wasn't just broken. It was smashed. Looks like someone threw a rock at it or smashed it with a sledgehammer, Jack exclaimed. You're right. Probably the Shatner boys down the road here, replied Mr. Peterson, pointing an index finger to the right of Jack. They must be the little pricks. Jack paused and stroked his bristly beard. He always wanted to remain professional when dealing with a customer, but his inner trailer park boy would slip out from time to time. Uh, punks that stole my jigsaw the last time I worked around here. Don't worry, my wife would have their racks if they did this, Mr. Peterson replied upon seeing the angered look on Jack's face. You're not a bender, are you? Asked Mr. Peterson. Bender was the term used for lifelong residents of Pine and North Bend. Jack's Piedmont accent stood out ever so slightly from everyone else. No, sir, from Virginia originally, about two hours from here. The rotund man smiled and nodded his head before speaking again. We get a lot of transplants here from Virginia and up north, surprisingly. Folks always want to turn this place into a bigger city like where they come from, not realizing they came here in the first place because it wasn't that. Mr. Peterson chuckled. They call us country folk dumb. To me, though, that seems pretty dumb of them. Anyway, were you able to find lights like this one? He pulled out his phone and showed Jack a picture of the fixture he wanted. Yes, sir, got him right in my truck. Jack walked over to his truck bed and got the box containing the new light fixtures. Go ahead and change the ones on the other side of the house as well. Yes, sir. I'll let you know when I finish. With that, Jack got out his ladder and got to work. He set up his ladder underneath the smashed fixture, and as he began to climb up, he paused and looked down to ensure his ladder was footed correctly. There was a bush to the right, and he noticed a small rock behind it. Curiosity got the better of him, and he climbed down and picked it up. It was about the size of his fist and spherical in shape. It wasn't a perfect sphere, but it reminded him of a snowball one would make, with all of its imperfections. Weird, he thought. It looked as if it had been purposefully rounded out. He placed the rock next to the ladder to show Mr. Peterson. After Jack finished the installations, he knocked on the front door. The door opened, and a teenage girl in a pink jumper stood there. You looking for my dad? She asked. Yeah, would you mind getting him for me? The girl turned around and called for her father. A few seconds went by, and no reply was sent back. He's probably on the phone again. Our dog went missing last night. The idiot always runs away every chance he gets, said the girl. A moment later, Mr. Peterson came to the door and said, Sorry, I was on the phone with the pound. Our dog is lost again. Do you have any pets? Jack thought of the beagle, Ralph, who was Dave's dog. Yeah, a beagle. He's pretty adventurous himself, replied Jack. You didn't happen to see a black lab on the way in? Asked Mr. Peterson with hopefulness. No, sir, but I'll keep an eye out for the pup. What's his name? Snape, replied Mr. Peterson. You know, from Harry Potter. Jack accepted a check from Mr. Peterson and got back into his truck after shaking his hand. The truth was, he loved dogs. His wife Anna was more of a cat person, but Jack always wanted a German Shepherd. He had one dog as a kid. His old man got it for him for his twelfth birthday. It was a mutt named Chop. Jack loved Chop and brought him everywhere he went in the rural town where he grew up in Virginia. Dogs reminded him of home and his youth. He was only in North Carolina because he had met Anna on a dating site several years prior. He knew she was too good for him, but she loved him anyway. 
He was a redneck with a temper and constantly battled against his love for the drink. His father had been an alcoholic who died of liver failure when Jack was only in his early 20s. It had been nearly 10 years since that happened. He really didn't like to think about it. He loved his old man, even though he had been an asshole most of the time. So was Jack, for that matter. He knew that Anna, a beautiful nurse from Winston-Salem, could run off with another man if she wanted, a man who had a new truck and a place of his own. For some reason, though, she stayed at his side, loyal and loving, much like Chop. Jack stroked his beard and turned on the radio. Country Roads by John Denver was playing, and Jack immediately began to sing along with it. What the hell? Jack said out loud. He turned down the radio and brought his truck to a stop. He put his Chevy into park and got out. He looked out of his driver's window to see a dog lying in a drainage ditch on the side of the road. The dog was lying on its side, nearly still, with its tongue sticking out and panting heavily. He noticed that one of its back legs was snapped and bent in the opposite direction. It wasn't the black lab, Snape, but a hound of some sort. Jack rubbed it behind its ears and patted its side gently. What happened to you, bud? Car? Jack spoke to it with a tender voice. He was stricken with the painful memory of his beloved Chop dying in his arms after getting hit by a dump truck. He felt deep compassion for the animal that appeared to be dying before him. Jack remained there for an hour until the dog passed on. He pointed the finger at frustrated drivers trying to get around his truck. Rest in peace, bud, and may God give you all the deer you want to chase. Into the bed of his Chevy, Jack placed the poor hound. He picked up the dog very carefully while supporting its head. He wrapped the dog in a tarp and drove off home. Part 3. Fire Sirens broke the silent night air in the town of Pine Bend. Eric was driving the fire truck this time and was navigating the streets well. Turn here, his captain said as he pointed to Ridgeview Avenue. They had gotten a call about a woman whose kitchen was on fire. They arrived at the house on the corner of Pine and Oak. The firemen got to work putting the fire out. Thankfully, it hadn't spread beyond the kitchen. Thank you so much. I was cooking dinner and only left it unattended for a few minutes, the lady said who had made the call. Eric could tell she was local by the way she spoke. That's all it takes, ma'am. Just a few minutes and fire can spread. Lucky for you, the station's only a mile away. He replied as he patted the tall, rotund woman on the back to console her. It's contained now, ma'am. Be sure to take some pictures for insurance as soon as the smoke clears, okay? Said the captain as he approached the woman. I will. Thank you. Thank you all so much. She hugged the captain and Eric tightly. Say, ma'am, what were you cooking anyway? Eric asked to lighten the mood. Uh, bacon for BLTs. My husband is a trucker on his way home from a long haul. I wanted to make him his favorite food. I enjoy a good BLT myself, especially with a slice of American on it. That's the slaps, Eric said with a big smile while nodding his head. I got distracted. There was some animal in our backyard. I thought it might be our dog, Remy. He ran off a few days ago. The woman explained while Eric and the captain listened intently. There were eyes, you see. Yellow ones. It definitely wasn't my dog. I went outside to call for Remy and the animal ran off into the nearby woods. He's a hungry boy that never misses a meal. How did he run away? Do you keep him outside? Inquired Eric. Well, yeah, he was on that chain. She pointed to a long, rusty chain that lay on the ground. I don't know how he did it, but he slipped his collar. Eric walked over to it, picked up the red nylon collar, and examined it. 
more so to be polite than to show any real interest. As he ran his fingers around the collar, he got a whiff of something foul. Friggin' hell, that's rank, Eric said as he dropped the collar. There was some kind of residue on it. It seemed like it was dry, yet it still contained some of its musky odor. That's odd. Remy doesn't smell too bad. We bathe him regularly. He loves it, said the woman. The captain reassured the woman that the fire was contained and told her to call if she needed anything. Eric got some hand sanitizer out of his first aid kit and generously applied it to his soiled hands. He had smelled a lot of nasty things in his career, but this odor made it on his top five list. Before the smell, he had been hungry and was looking forward to returning to the station to finish the lasagna Emily had made for him. His appetite now dissipated like the fire that he put out. Eric's lieutenant approached him with purpose in his step. Eric, we gotta go. Some elderly couple locked themselves out of their house. Okay, but what about... Team 2 will remain here, but we gotta go. It's only a few blocks. Come on. His middle-aged lieutenant sported a short, gray mustache with a shaved head. He had been Eric's mentor when he had first arrived in Pine Bend. Eric followed the lieutenant and hopped in one of the SUVs. What's the hurry, anyway? Eric knew the lieutenant to normally be a patient man and well-collected. This made him uneasy. This batch said for us to hurry, said that the couple was panicked and that something was in the woods behind their house, like a bear or something. Are the cops coming too? Yeah, man. Dispatch notified them also and got a hold of animal control. Eric tried to relax as he laid his head against the rest. He had never seen a bear except in those documentaries where bears attacked people. They frightened him if he was honest with himself. The cops should take care of any bear. Don't worry, man. I don't like them either, but they are pretty common here the lieutenant said, as if he were trying to convince himself as much as he was Eric. Within minutes, they pulled up to a single-story brick house with its porch light on. On the porch was the elderly couple that presumably had made the call. Eric and the lieutenant got out of the cab, walking toward the porch while the rest of the fire crew stood around the SUV. The couple remained on the porch, unmoved and shaking. The lieutenant greeted them and received no response. They just looked at him with deep fear in their eyes. Eric called for one of the other firemen to bring blankets over. He wrapped the blankets around the couple, and they seemed to relax a little. You're safe now. The police will be here soon, don't worry, the lieutenant offered. The husband, who had a hunched back and Coke bottle glasses, pointed a crooked finger at the forest across the street. He held it there as he stared at Eric with eyes that said, Go look. Eric grabbed the flashlight from his pocket and turned it on. He assured the man he would go check it out and walked off toward the tree line. This is a job for a cop. I swear, if there's a bear over here, I'm go... A pair of glowing eyes appeared before him. They were bright and burned like fireflies in June. Eric became a statue. The beam from his flashlight was fixed just below the pair of eyes. He wanted to raise it to expose the being that was standing less than 20 feet away. He remained still for several seconds, just staring into the amber jewels. What is it, Eric? One of the other firemen called out. Eric jerked up and felt like he had just woken up from a dream. He turned his head half back and responded, There's something in the woods! When he looked back, the eyes were gone. He heard it walking away. It sounded slow, as if it wasn't concerned about Eric or anyone else nearby. He returned to the porch and assured the couple that it was gone. The lieutenant insisted that animal control and the police would be there shortly to ensure that the area was secure. Eric got out his lock-picking kit and unlocked the front door in a few minutes. 
the couple still remained silent. Paramedics arrived on the scene and addressed the couple. Eric and the rest of the crew climbed back into the fire truck and headed for the station. Man, did you see the fear in their eyes? They were absolutely petrified, Eric exclaimed. The lieutenant replied detachedly, I've seen that kind of fear before, only once. He paused as if to see if Eric was interested. Go on, sir, he replied. The lieutenant exhaled slowly and then started. Before I lived here, I was a fireman on the coast. It was a small town just outside of a city near the beach. We were having a quiet day at the station, just sitting around playing cards, when a call came in. Someone had gone missing during the logging job, and they needed us to help with traffic so everyone could get into the woods to investigate. They never found him. He paused and scratched the stubble on his chin. About three days later, we were again called to the same lumber camp. We saw the paramedics carting a Hispanic man out of the woods when we arrived. His body was mangled and ripped up. We thought he'd had an accident with an excavator or a wood chipper. We found out later that the man had been attacked by something, mauled even. The game warden was there investigating and asked everyone to keep quiet about it. They said it was just a bear and didn't want the locals to get spooked. We didn't question it. We did our job and that was that. That game warden had a similar look of fear in his eyes as that elderly couple did tonight. It's a primal fear. A fear that you're no longer at the top of the food chain. Jeez, man, that would have scared the crap out of me too, Eric replied. The lieutenant nodded slowly and kept driving. Part 4. Dark. David enjoyed splitting wood. It was both relaxing and invigorating to him. As he swung the axe, he thought deeply about Brandon and his financial issues. He wanted to help his brother get out of debt and pay off those credit cards. Brand was good at many things. Cooking, talking to people, shooting guns, and being dependable. He was really only bad with finances. Sweetie, do you want a cup of coffee? Rachel called out to him from the kitchen window. Absolutely. That would be great if you made some extra for the guys. It was Friday night again, and he was looking forward to everyone gathering around the fire pit. After splitting half a dozen more logs, he went inside and looked in the fridge for a beer. Darn, no more lager. He hoped Jack had some downstairs. He remembered that Erica told him that he was bringing some beer tonight. He got his smartphone out of his pocket and called him. Hey man, you planning on coming tonight? Asked Dave. Yeah man, I'm on my way now actually. Had a crazy day at work, replied Eric. Oh yeah? What happened? Well, it was pretty disturbing to say the least. A man in the woods apparently terrorized this family out in North Bend. The father was killed. Man, it was really shitty. Did they catch the guy who did it? asked David with a hint of shock. Pine Bend and the surrounding area were truly a place where nothing ever happened. No murders, no crime. It was just a quiet, rural community. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly sponsored by Mr. Ballin, an Amazon Music exclusive podcast. Now, my friends, we spoke earlier of one incident in particular. However, they cover lots of experiences. A teen solo hiker who was terrorized for days by unknown figures dressed in white. Now, this sounds like my worst nightmare. I mean, imagine it. You're in your teenage years, venturing out on your own to get in touch with nature and get some exercise in. You would think your main concern would be getting lost, but this episode proves different, and that's not all. 
In another episode, we hear about two cops who quit their job at a local theater because of unexplained encounters with an alleged demon. Now, I know those in law enforcement experience a lot of the unimaginable in their everyday work, but something to make not only one officer leave, but two? And if that's not enough for you, there's an isolated forest in Canada where people keep turning up headless. That's repeated decapitations, folks. They're all wickedly intriguing, but I have to admit that this one got me the most. The evils of the forest and outdoors have always been something that's drawn me in, and this show makes finding true events like that all the easier. And these are just some of the strange, dark, and mysterious stories you'll hear each week on the Mr. Ballin Podcast. Hey, Amazon Prime members, listen to the Amazon Music exclusive podcast, Mr. Ballin Podcast. Strange, dark, and mysterious stories in the Amazon Music app. Download the app today. Nah, man, they didn't. The husband, too, he was... Eric paused, and David could tell that he was very disturbed by it. You don't have to say any more. Just get here and we'll enjoy some beers and you can get your mind off of it, okay? Eric agreed, and the two friends hung up. The news bothered David deeply. He and Rachel had one son, Timothy, who went to school here. Rachel worked three days a week at the hospital. She carried a gun. David made sure of it, but that didn't make him feel any better. He went into the garage at the front of the house, got the camping chairs, and set them up around the fire pit. Jack rolled up first and hopped out of his Chevy. Hey, Dave, you got any lagers? No, sadly. I was hoping you had some, replied David. Shit, you should have told me. I would have stopped at the gas station on the way. Jack grabbed a pale ale from the patio table where David had sat them down. Don't tell the firemen, okay? Jack asked as he popped the top and then took a big gulp. Eric arrived within an hour, and to David's surprise, he brought beer and cigars. He even brought lager for Jack. Where was Brandon? You guys get the fire going. I'm going to go see where Brand is. Brandon was flying down the road in his 2018 Camaro. His wife, Alex, was texting on her phone in the passenger seat. I hope that the kids will be all right. I'm concerned that your mother's dementia is worsening and I can't get a freaking signal out here, Alex stated worriedly in her Midwestern accent. Babe, they'll be fine. My mom still has her wits about her. I suppose the worst they could do is burn down the house if she falls asleep, Brandon replied with a grin. Don't even say that. She punched him on the arm. Where Brandon was sarcastic and light, Alex was serious and heavy. I'm trying to send her all the instructions again, just to make sure she doesn't forget. Babe, you need a night like this, just you and the gals and some wine, he replied gently. Are you saying I'm tense? Probably because you're driving like a jerk. She punched him again in the arm. They were running late, and he hated being late more than anything. Alex hated it even more. He opted to keep quiet. If you hadn't been on your computer playing that stupid game, we'd already be there by now, she scolded. Brandon's work had been stressing him out. He really wanted out of the salesman position and wanted to move up to management or get a new career. Video games were a way to unwind, to let go of stress. His wife, however, was not fond of it, and sometimes he wondered if she even loathed him because of it. In her mind, the perfect man was disciplined and stoic, and spent his free time tending to things around the house. Brandon's father was a militant disciplinarian, 
And every day growing up, they had to follow a strict, rigid schedule. Fun was allowed, but only at the time allotted. She should have married his father. They came around a sharp curve, and woods surrounded the road on both sides. It was dark. Brandon picked up speed, and Alex began protesting. Slow down your ass! There's deer on this road! Watch out! On the road, a dark shape ran out in front of them. Brandon slammed on the brakes, but it was too late. The fender clipped the shape before it could clear the car. Whatever they hit felt big and heavy. I think we just hit a deer, said Brandon. We? We? That was all you. Get out and make sure whatever you hit is okay. Brandon didn't argue. He opened the door, turned on the flashlight on his phone, and scanned the nearby road. When he didn't see any animal, he panned over to the front of his Camaro and saw that the driver's side headlight was busted. Great, now Dave was going to have more to laugh about. He walked a few feet into the woods and looked around. When he was satisfied that everything was okay, he returned to the car. When he grabbed the door handle and began to open it, he heard a noise. It sounded like something was coming out of the woods behind him. Brandon turned around and shined his light where he had just come from. The light illuminated a large log flying in his direction like a missile through the air. With a loud thud, the log impacted the driver's door to his left, barely missing him and putting a large dent in the metal. He didn't even have time to think, and his body went immediately into survival mode. He threw open the car door and got into the driver's seat. What the hell was that, Brandon? Alex asked in a panic. Brandon was silent and was trying to focus on the task at hand. He put the car into drive and was about to press the gas when he saw another log in the corner of his eye. He had no time to react, and it penetrated the window and punched him on the left side of his face, causing his head to jerk to the right. He was instantly dazed and felt an immense amount of warm pain in his cheek and upper jaw. Alex screamed so sharply that her voice might have broken the window itself. Despite it all, Brandon felt a sense of luck. The window had softened the blow, and it could have been a lot worse. After a few seconds of stunning pain, Brandon pushed the log out of the window and pressed his other hand to his broken face. There was blood and bits of glass embedded under the skin of his cheek. He tried to flex his jaw, but was unable to. It was stiff and disjointed. Gotta get the hell out of here. He got oriented, lined up his foot with the gas pedal, and pushed down hard. He was shocked when the vehicle didn't move. That's when he felt it. The car's rear end was being lifted up by something. The rear tires just spun in place. He frantically turned the wheel left and right. He tried honking the horn again and again, but to no avail. Whatever had them was strong, stronger than anything that Brandon knew. Finally, after enough sharp rotations of the steering wheel, the rear end of the Camaro slammed back down and took off. Brandon was elated to be free, but it was short-lived. The car crashed into a large pine tree next to the curve of the road. Brandon's head spun like a hurricane in the ocean and he felt nauseous and dazed. Still alive, at least. He turned his head to the right and looked at Alex. His vision was blurred by blood and haze. Babe? Babe, are you okay? He said slowly. Her head was drooped with her chin touching her chest. She nodded slightly, and Brandon felt a small sense of relief. He reached his right hand over and caressed his wife's head. We'll be okay, babe. I just need to find my phone. She nodded faintly as her head remained hung. 
Brandon gently patted his right pocket where he always kept his phone. Not there. He checked his left side but only felt his pocket knife. Where is that thing? He frantically patted the area of the cab around him. The dizziness amped up with his increased movement, and he felt bile rush to his throat. He quickly opened the door and let it out on the ground beneath him. He remained with his head slouched for several moments just to ensure he was finished. That's when he remembered that they weren't alone. He slammed the door shut and looked around using his mirrors. He shifted between all three but couldn't see anything. It was just too dark. His investigation ended when he heard the jingle of his ringtone. His phone sounded close, but not within grabbing distance. Frantically, he looked around and saw the faint glow. It was on the ground just outside his door. Must have fallen out when I opened the door to puke. He opened the door and reached for his phone. A wet grunt made him freeze. Brandon's eyes scanned the area, but saw nothing. He wished, now more than ever, that he had brought his gun. Alex told him he looked too fat with it sticking out from his gut and convinced him to leave it at home tonight. He swore that he would never go anywhere again without his pistol, if he made it out of this. His phone continued to ring, and he saw that it was his brother, David, calling. He snapped himself out of the freeze and grabbed the phone. His finer coordination had left him with adrenaline coursing through his body, and he was having trouble swiping to answer. Another grunt jerked his head away from the screen. This one sounded like it came from right beside him. With quick reflexes, he slammed the door shut again and tried swiping. Blood and sweat from his face had dripped onto the screen, and he couldn't get it to answer. He used his shirt to try and wipe it off, but it only made it spread more. He cursed aloud and wiped the screen on his pant leg. By now, the ringing had stopped, but if he could just make one call, he could get help. Another grunt caught his attention. Just astride outside his window, he saw a large creature looming over the car. It had burning yellow eyes that didn't blink. He stared at the creature, completely fixated on its gaze. The pain he had previously felt was overruled by a dread so deep that he couldn't breathe. The last thing Brandon saw was a large black hand coming at his face. Part 5. Haze where is he? David thought to himself. He tried calling again, but received no answer. As David walked over to them, Jack and Eric were stacking logs in the pit. Guys, I don't know where Brandon is, but I'm sure he'll be here any time. Let's crack a few cold ones and get this fire going. Hell yeah, I can use one after a day like today, said Eric. The three friends talked and sipped beer. As far as David could tell, Eric and Jack seemed to be getting along well. They laughed, told jokes, and shared stories from each other's jobs. Eric recounted the gruesome call he went on earlier that day. When he mentioned the name Peterson, Jack perked up from his relaxed slump. The Peterson family off of Young Oak Road in North Bend? Jack asked with wide eyes. Yeah, do you know them? I just did work for them earlier in the week. You said someone murdered Mr. Peterson? Yeah, the police seem to think so anyway. Jack slumped back in his camping chair and stared at the ground. He finished his beer by taking a large gulp and then sat it down on the patio next to him. He quickly picked up another one, cracked it open, and downed it with a few swallows. The Petersons are good people. At least from what I was able to tell, Jack said solemnly. They carried on the morbid conversation for several more minutes. 
all three men were concerned for their families. David got a phone call and walked away from the group. It was his mother, and she sounded hoarse. Eric watched David's shoulders drop with his phone. He watched as David hastily walked back over. I've got to go. Brandon's been in some kind of accident. He's in the ER. We're going with you, man, said Jack as he finished his beer and got up. Eric nodded rapidly and put on his coat. David notified Rachel of the situation before they climbed into his SUV and sped off. At the ER, David's mother informed them of what the police found. A passerby stopped by what looked like an abandoned vehicle off of North Bend Drive. It was Brandon's car. They... they... Mrs. Schultz started to choke up. David grabbed her and held his mother tightly. They said that it looked like an attempted murder. She began bawling into David's shoulder. Oh, David, he was almost killed. My little Brandy. Mrs. Schultz continued sobbing, and David held her pressed to his shoulder. When she finished, she wiped her tears with her windbreaker sleeve and swallowed. I bet it was that bitch of a wife of his. I never liked her. She always acted like she was the queen of the world and treated him like a servant. Brandon's two young children, Ryan and Rose, were sitting on the floor, coloring. They looked up at their grandmother with worried expressions. Mom, that's outrageous. Alex's family, replied David. She wasn't there, Dave. She left with him to come to your house, but she wasn't in the car when the police arrived. I think she's guiltier than sin. A nurse in navy blue scrubs with brown hair tied in a ponytail came out of the operating room and approached David and Mrs. Schultz. David recoiled at this and shook his head. Jack stood by Eric, and the two talked quietly. The injuries to his head appear to be severe, probably a concussion, and the doctor thinks his jaw is significantly fractured. He's going into surgery now. We'll keep you updated. Thank you, ma'am. Please do, replied David. The nurse returned to the OR, and Mrs. Schultz found a nearby bench to sit on. Jack approached David and asked, Do you want to pray, brother? Yes, was his only reply. David looked into Jack's eyes with tears in his own. Eric joined in on the huddle, and the three men prayed. Mrs. Schultz rocked back and forth while holding her arms. After the men finished, David walked over and sat beside her. The surgery took several hours, and it was around midnight when the doctor came out to inform the family. He was in green surgical scrubs and sported a steely beard. Well, he's stable as of now. He had some swelling in his brain, but we were able to relieve it. His jaw was also fractured, and he may have trouble talking for some time, and he'll definitely need to have it wired shut. Whoever did that to him must have been one mean SOB. What do you mean by that? asked David. The kind of trauma he sustained I only see from car accidents, like the ones where a pedestrian is hit by a bus, to be frank. He's very lucky to be alive. When can we see him? Mrs. Schultz asked with urgency. After he's transferred out of the ICU, ma'am, we need to keep an eye on him for just a little longer. The doctor gave a reassuring smile. David turned to Jack and Eric. You guys can go. It's really late. Hell no, man. We got your back. Ain't that right, Eric? Jack said as he gave a firm pat on Eric's back. Yeah, whatever you need, man, Eric replied. David responded with a nod and a smile. I need to call Rachel. Can you guys keep an eye open for the police? My mom said they'd probably come by to get some information from us. Jack nodded. Do what you gotta do, bud. With that, David walked out of the ER and phoned his wife. I wonder if the same asshole that did in Mr. Peterson did the same thing to Brand, Jack speculated. 
Maybe, but isn't it suspicious that his wife wasn't in the car with him? Eric replied. Jack scowled at Eric intensely. Nah, man, shove that kind of talk up your ass. Alex is a little high strung, but she ain't a murderer. Eric recoiled at Jack's scolding and hastily walked outside. What an asshole, Eric thought as he pulled out a thin cigar from his jacket. He pulled out his bick and lit it up. The first drag seemed to take the edge off immediately, and he sighed. He saw David in the parking lot, pacing back and forth while on the phone. He thought to call Emily and tell her what was going on. When she answered, it relaxed him further, and he felt a sense of elation. Her gentle voice caressed his ear, and he almost forgot to say hello. Yeah, sweetie, I'm, I'm here. Sorry, it's been a long day, he explained. I can imagine. I got your text earlier. Sorry I didn't respond. Work has kept me busy, replied Emily. Eric talked to his wife for another ten minutes and then departed with the usual I love you to the Milky Way and back. He knew it was corny and cliched, but he didn't care. Emily was the best thing to ever happen to him. He had gone on several dates from the app but never clicked with anyone until he met her. She stood a whole head and a half shorter than he and wore a green summer dress with a lemon tree print decorating it. Her brown hair sat upon her bare shoulders, and she smiled with teeth as white as the clouds above them. He looked carefully into her hazel-colored eyes and knew right then and there that she was the one for him. He drove ten hours from New Jersey to have a picnic with her at a place called Reynolds Garden. The sky was big, and the place was filled with lush greenery and flowers. That day was bright, but its radiance paled compared to Emily's. Only three months passed before they were engaged, and three months after that was the wedding. It was the happiest time of his life, and he still felt the warmth of joy from it. They were coming up on their sixth month of marriage, and he still hated being away from her. He encouraged her to come with him to the Friday night gathering, but she was shy. He didn't mind that about her. After all, he too was on the meek side. If David had not approached him in the first place, he probably wouldn't have any friends in Pine Bend. David finished up his phone call and approached Eric with a worried look. I've got to get home. The police are on the way to the house and I need to be there, said David. Rachel said that Ralph was going nuts about something outside. I understand, man. What about the police? Do you think they might come here to ask us questions? Between Jack and my mom, I think they'll be able to get enough info. At David's reply, Eric walked closer to David and put a hand on his shoulder. Well, at least let me go with you to give you some company. Sure, I appreciate it. Let me go tell them that we're leaving. After that, the two men departed for David's home. Ralph? Come on, Ralph. Come get a treat. Rachel tried for the tenth time to coax the beagle back inside. She waved the dog biscuit in his direction rapidly and held a flashlight in her other hand that was focused on Ralph. Come on, boy, please, she said more frantically. Ralph just kept barking and pacing back and forth along the fence. It was in his nature to pursue squirrels and other animals, and he commonly alerted them of deer and foxes. This time was different, though. They could always call him back with food or treats. Rachel grabbed her phone off of the kitchen counter and dialed her husband again. David picked up after the first ring. Hey, babe, is everything okay? I can't get Ralph back inside. I've tried everything. How far are you? Still ten minutes out, but coming as fast as I can. Okay, drive safe. I'm sure the police will be here any time. She hung up and returned her attention to the dog. Shining the flashlight upon him revealed that he was staring at something through the fence. 
His tail was curved upward, and his snout was pointed straight with his left paw raised. Rachel knew this was the pointer position, and he was fixated. She was never one to panic or be easily afraid of anything. She was a backpacker and an ER nurse who had dealt with intense situations before. This, however, combined with a murderer at large, worried her. She took a deep breath and stepped onto the back patio stairs. She called his name again, but Ralph remained stern. Just go out and grab him. She walked cautiously toward her dog. A feeling of immense doom began to wrap around her tightly. She paused. Come on, Ralph, please come on. She took several more careful steps. Let's go, boy! Come on! She shouted, this time as loud as she could muster. This got the beagle's attention, and he jerked his head to the right to look at her. That's it, boy. Come to me. Ralph's tail began to wag, and he turned toward his owner. That's a good boy. A grunt sounded from behind the fence. The noise was animalistic and wet, like that of a horse. Ralph looked back, and Rachel froze. Go on! Get out of here! Go! She shouted with authority at whatever was on the other side. Ralph began to bark and run parallel to the fence. Ralph, please come inside now! She began to speed walk toward her dog, who was less than a dozen yards away. Ralph ceased his barking and stopped running. He cocked his head and stared through tiny gaps in the fence. All was silent. She was nearly within arm's reach of Ralph. Come to me, Ralph! Come to... Rachel stopped her advance and noticed what the beagle was looking at. She saw part of a face in a small slit about five feet off the ground. Her flashlight showed something human-like but it was off. It had a glowing yellow eye and a full beard that covered most of its face from what she could tell. It didn't like the light and bore its teeth and growled. Rachel slowly turned her head toward Ralph and made a kissing noise to try to bring him in. The dog's nose was only inches away from the thing behind the fence. Rachel jumped in fright when the wooden panel split in two and a black fist pushed through the break. Ralph wailed as a broken piece of wood hit his nose. He ran away with his tail between his legs. The fist tried to retract, but it was pinched between the boards. Another grunt was made, and it sounded angry. Rachel watched hairy black fingers grip the upper board and rip it outward with ferocity, and its fist was free. On instinct, she turned around and sprinted into the house, slamming the door behind her. She grabbed her phone and began to dial David. Ralph, she thought. She couldn't leave him out there, no matter how much she feared for her own life. Think about Tim. I can't leave him here alone, either. She bounced on her heels while debating her course of action. Tim is upstairs asleep. He'll be all right. She unlocked the door and put her hand on the sliding handle. Everything okay? A female voice croaked behind her. Rachel jumped, but was relieved when she realized it was her sister-in-law. Anna stood there with runny makeup and swollen eyes that indicated she had been crying. Her wavy brown hair was in a messy bun, and she wore matching sky-blue pajamas. Anna, someone's trying to get into the backyard. It might be the murderer. Anna had just woken up, and her memory was foggy. She had plenty of wine already before discovering that her brother had been attacked. Shit, where are the boys? Asked Anna with widened eyes. Dave is on the way back here. I think Jack stayed to support your mom. Anna felt a twitch of guilt. 
She wanted to be at the hospital with her brother, but Jack insisted that he go instead. When Anna drank too much, she became belligerent. I need your help. Ralph is out there and is probably injured. I need you to stay here and watch my back while I go and get him. Hold on a minute. There's a murderer in the backyard and you want to go out there? Hell no, you have a kid, Anna protested. He's in danger and... Look, sis, I'm just drunk enough to go do this myself, Anna said, pointing to the flashlight in Rachel's hand. Keep that light on the yard and I'll find him. No, you aren't going out there either, rebutted Rachel. Their argument ended when they saw Ralph walk up to the door. His nose was bloody, and the area around his face, which was usually white, was stained red. He pawed at the glass in the sliding door and whimpered. Rachel let him inside, and he waddled in with a terrified posture. She shut the door quickly and locked it. Anna tended to Ralph, whose nose was still bleeding. Anna wiped off the beagle's nose with gentle hands and a paper towel. Ralph yelped in pain despite her light touch. Rachel felt foolish when she remembered they had new floodlights. Jack had installed them a few weeks ago. She flicked them on and the backyard was instantly illuminated. It was empty to her relief. Anna stemmed the bleeding on Ralph's nose while Rachel kept watch. Both of the women perked up when they saw headlights penetrate the windows on the front of the house. Rachel ran outside and embraced David before he could get out of the driver's seat. She felt safe and secure in her husband's strong arms and remained there for several moments. After she let go of him, she explained the ordeal. David grabbed his Glock 19 pistol and flashlight from his glove box and investigated the backyard. Eric followed him with a pocket flashlight of his own. After finding the backyard empty, they returned to David's wife. Did the police not show up? asked David. No, I guess they're still on the way, but it's been a half hour, she replied. David called 911. Hi, my wife called to have some officers come and take a look in our backyard because our dog was acting like someone was trying to get in. No one has arrived yet, and someone... Sir, all of our officers are responding to another case. We'll send someone out to you as soon as possible. The woman on dispatch replied. Someone was trying to break into our fenced yard. They injured our dog. Is that someone still there? Asked the dispatcher. No, I think they're gone. Okay, lock your doors and windows and remain inside. We'll get someone out there as soon as we can. David did so, and then grabbed his hunting rifle and sat vigil in the kitchen. He encouraged Rachel to go to bed and for Anna to sleep in the spare room upstairs where she would be less exposed versus the basement. With a kiss on the cheek and a long hug, his wife crept up the stairs and went to bed. Anna gave him a hug, and then she went to bed herself. David sat poised upright in the wooden dining chair with his rifle across his lap. Ralph lay at his feet. Eric was in a chair, drinking coffee next to him. The injured beagle let out a whine every few minutes. Don't worry, buddy. We'll get you to the vet tomorrow, David said while petting him on the back. The two men sat in the dark, wordless, until Eric decided to break the silence. Man, when I moved here, I thought it'd be a little laxer. It usually is. Pine Bend is a peaceful community. We get rednecks blowing up tannerite and setting the forest on fire every so often, but that's it, replied David. Occasionally, we'll get some theft or break-ins, but nothing violent. The people here just want to chew their tobacco and drive around big compensators. Eric grinned and asked, What's a compensator? A Ford F-350 with a front lift kit, the most popular truck in the pines. The two men talked into the early morning hours, and when the sun rose, they walked outside to check out the backyard in the daylight. 
Man, whoever that was did some major damage to your fence. Looks like someone took a sledgehammer to it, Eric stated while examining the broken fence panel. Rachel said it was a fist that someone punched through it. Really? We must have frickin' Mike Tyson after us then. Eric touched the broken panel and recoiled when he felt slime. Ah, damn, this nasty crap again. He wiped his hand on his pants. Is this musk or something that dogs leave around? I've never had a dog, but this is probably why. David used his index finger to gather some of the slimy residue. That definitely didn't come from our dog. Back at the hospital, Jack and Mrs. Schultz were invited to see Brandon. He was awake, but delirious. His head was wrapped in layers of bandages. His whole face was swollen beyond its normal size. The few inches of exposed skin were deep blue. Small white bandages decorated his cheeks and nose. Hey, buddy, how are you feeling? Jack asked with a smile. Brandon gave the slightest nod and blinked at Jack rapidly. You're okay, you're okay, you're okay, Brandy, Mrs. Schultz said in between tears. She rubbed the top of his head gently. Brandon continued to rapidly blink at Jack. What, do you need a tissue? Jack went into the bathroom and grabbed some tissue paper. Here you go, bud. Brandon turned his face to the right, away from Jack's tissue offering. Once Jack brought the tissue away, Brandon nodded his head upward and tried to speak. I think he's trying to tell us who did this to him, exclaimed Mrs. Schultz. Oh, oh. Alex? He said Alex. I knew it was that bitch. Brandon slowly shook his head and tears fell from his eyes. No. Oh. Jack leaned in with his ear a few inches from Brandon's mouth. No, Alex. No, Alex. No, Alex? Do you mean not Alex? Brandon nodded slowly. Oh, shit. That means that Alex is in trouble. Brandon nodded, and more tears came down his face. You've been listening to It Came From The Pines, Part 1, by Justin Vinbell. That's it for this week, listeners, but I hope that you'll join us next week for Part 2 of this trilogy. Thanks for being here with us, and take care. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page, or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts, and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show. And that means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. As for me personally, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube 
username Viking Guitar, and also on Instagram as Viking Guitar Productions. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another Dance with Darkness, I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it, especially if you live in Pine Bend, North Carolina. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's episode was hosted by, and its featured tale performed by, yours truly, Eric Peabody. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Nikki McSorley and Eric Peabody. Finalization by Craig Groshek and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for future production. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, please subscribe to us to make sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect any time and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to let us know how we're doing and leave us a kind comment. Lastly, don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archives and ad-free downloads of all of your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, you can hear more of my work on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights podcast. However, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.